Good morning, church. The Lord be with you. It's good to see everyone this morning, those of you worshiping in person and our online congregation. Thank you for carving out time to make worship a priority in your weekly rhythm. Uh, We gather for worship to glorify God and so that the people of God might be sanctified or shaped into the loving image of Jesus Christ. And we will turn our attention to those acts of worship here in just a moment. But before we do, uh, we have a few announcements for you this morning. Uh, I believe, having just made her way up the aisle here, uh, Harley Kathleen Joyner might have... Jordan? Harley Kathleen Jordan might have made her way into the sanctuary. And if you can't see her in the front pew up here, there is a lovely picture included in your bulletin. So we celebrate life. Uh, Life is a gift from God. And we want to make sure that we celebrate that. Of course, parents christen uh, Danielle and uh, big sisters uh, Izzy and... Bethany and AJ and grandparents Terry and Carol and, of course, great-grandparents William and Sheila Rhodes. Our family celebrates with you. So, uh, as well, there's going to be another little girl. And, look, I have three daughters, so all this girl talk is fine with me. So, we have another little girl uh, that, that's heading this way. We have a diaper shower. Uh, for Rocky and Chelsea, and that will be Sunday, April 18th from 2 to 4. So you can uh, get in touch with Dee Dee Flippo if you want further announcements on that. You also have an insert in your bulletin. This today is Palm Passion Sunday. It's the Sunday in which we uh, discuss Jesus' entry into Jerusalem where the people waved palm branches and shouted Hosanna, Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Then we turn our attention from palms to the passion or suffering of Jesus Christ as we prepare for the events of Holy Week. As you came in and got a bulletin, you will also notice there are palms in the shape of a cross. Feel free to take one of those. Those are for you. Uh, That is for the worship service today and also to take home with you uh, to kind of remind us of uh, the celebration of the palms and also the cursing uh, that the people did toward Jesus as he made his way to the cross. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. We have a lot of events this week. Uh, We will not have youth and children on Wednesday night because on Thursday of this week at 6 o'clock right here in the sanctuary, we will have our Monday Thursday service. Um, that's the, we will look at Jesus washing the feet of his disciples and uh, celebrating uh, the Passover meal with them right before he was uh, betrayed. Uh, be at peace. We will not be washing feet. I know sometimes that is a point of contention. I, was, I served a church uh, one time on staff. I was uh, over their worship and their uh, youth ministry, and the senior pastor there wanted to have a foot washing service, and he went to his wife uh, in the middle of that Monday Thursday service unannounced and tried to wash her feet, and she said, Ronald, get away from me. You're not washing my feet. <laughs> we're, we're not washing feet at the service, but no, we will talk about it and the significance of it. Uh, we will celebrate Holy Communion. Please come Thursday at 6 o'clock here. Uh, to celebrate that. Then on Friday at 6 o'clock in the Family Life Center, we will have what we call a tenebrae service. That is a service of shadows. And we will have some music and we will have some scripture readings and we will snuff out candles until there are no candles left to snuff out and we will be left in the darkness of the tomb. And we will exit that service in silence, preparing our hearts to sit in silence on Saturday as we anticipate and expect the wonderful Resurrection Day celebration that awaits us one week from today. On Saturday at 1 o'clock here at the church facility, if you have little ones, 6th grade and under, we will have an Easter egg hunt and a hot dog lunch. What, get, what is better than a bunch of kids running around collecting candy and eating hot dogs? I think this is fantastic. So come, enjoy, celebrate, and invite those in the community. Church, I believe that is the stuff. That, those are the announcements that get us all on the same page. We need to be on the same page moving forward together, but let's not waste another minute of this hour we've set apart. Let us now turn our attention toward our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me offer you this word of good news right from the outset. God loves you, and so do we. Welcome to worship at Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church. Let us pray. Divine God, we shout, Hosanna, blessed is Jesus who comes in God's name. Jesus sits astride a donkey, a beast of burden, bearing a most precious gift. May your joy fill our hearts as we shout our hosannas and as we prepare our hearts to worship and celebrate your glorious victory through love. And together, the people of God said, 
Amen. All who are able, please stand and let's join together in our call to worship. to the Lord, sing hallelujah to the Lord, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to the Lord, sing hallelujah to the Lord, sing hallelujah. seated. We've come to the time in our worship service where uh, we bring our best and our worst, our prayer requests and our praises, our praise reports and our heartbrokenness before God. God is faithful and just to hear it and be with us in the midst of all of life's trials and struggles. What names do we have to lift up before God today? Me. All right, Mary, we got you. <laughs> Say one more time. P.D. Jeffries, okay. Okay, Doris Petrie. Bobby Loveless. Dennis. Mm -hmm. Gary and Karen Addison. Okay. The Ross Hill family and Jerry. Okay. Betty Phillips, mm -hmm. Donna Hall, Wesley Gore, okay, okay, our military, mm -hmm. do we have any praise reports that we would like to lift up before God today? It's good to have folks gathered. Um, I also want to give thanks. Um, we had a lot of severe weather this week, and our area appeared to be fairly well spared. And uh, coming from a family that has uh, been through two tornadoes ourselves, we, are, we take that word pretty seriously, and so we were glad that uh, we did not have to uh, go through that again. Praise God for our Savior. Amen. Do we have any unspoken requests that you would like to make known by the uplifted hand? God sees that hand and knows the heart, and God is with us in the midst of whatever our needs are. Won't you please pray with me? Through the shouts and the branches, the Savior rides again into our hearts, our personal Jerusalems, if you will. The places that we have fortified, sometimes against even God's truth and love. Patient God. Be with us today as we witness again the entry of Jesus into the holy city and remind us that our holy cities, our souls, need to welcome Jesus in celebration and in commitment to his witness. We can so easily get caught up in the noise and forget the Savior himself. We can get so focused on the celebration and the colors that we look past the solitary figure on the small donkey's colt. We stand at the gates this day to welcome Jesus. May our welcome of Jesus also be reflected in our welcome of others who come into our midst within our community and even within our church doors. Free us from judgment and prejudice that we may be open to hearing your word through the ministry of Jesus and his disciples. And as we have spoken the names of ones who are near and dear to us who need your healing love, O oh God. Help us also to remember that we need a good measure of your grace and mercy. Pour out your grace, your mercy, and your healing abundantly on all the names that were called out this morning and those that were lifted up silently in our hearts. Bring us once again into the comfort of your love, God. Blessed is Jesus. Blessed is he who comes. 
and who continues to come into our lives forever. We offer this prayer in Jesus' holy name, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All who are able, please stand for our next congregational hymn. remain standing for our gospel reading this morning from the gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Hear these words. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, go into the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, its master needs it, and he'll send it back right away. They went and found a colt tied to a gate outside on the street, and they untied it. Some people standing around said to them, "Why? what are you doing untying the colt? They told them just what Jesus said, and they left them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on it. Many people spread out their clothes on the road, while others spread branches cut from the fields. Those in front of him and those following were shouting, Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. After he looked around at everything because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Congregation, you may be seated during our song of preparation in which we prepare our hearts to receive the preached word. Uh, But you are welcome to join us in singing this song.
In his book, Who Is This Man?, author and pastor John Ortberg offers us this little story. He said a man was walking along San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge and he saw a woman standing there, obviously feeling very lonely, and he ran up to her to tell her that God loved her. Upon saying this, a tear came to her eye, and then he asked her, you know, what's your religious background? Are you Christian? Are you from Jewish heritage? Are you Hindu, Muslim? What, you know, what's your, what's your background? And she said, I'm a Christian. And at saying this, he began to cheer. All right, you're Christian. We're on the same team. Are you Protestant or are you Catholic? She said, Protestant. Once again, he cheered. He was beginning to get excited at this point. He said, Protestant. All right, so what denomination? And she said, well, I'm Baptist. And once again, he began to cheer and get excited. He said, well, well, I'm Baptist too. Look at how much we have in common. Let me ask you this. Are you Northern Baptist or are you Southern Baptist? She replied, I'm, I'm, I'm Northern Baptist. And he got excited again. He began cheering. Yes, we have so much in common. Uh, Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? Northern Conservative Baptist, she replied. He got excited. He cheered again. Me too. This is fantastic. Are you Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist or Northern Conservative Reform Baptist? She replied, I'm Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist. And he got so excited, he was jumping up and down, cheering. He said, me too, that's fantastic. How about this, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Eastern Region? Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region, she replied. He jumped up and down, it's a miracle. He cheered that is fantastic. We have so much in common. Are you Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council 1879 or Council 1912? She replied, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. This time, no cheer. His face began to draw up, and instead of cheering, he jeered, and then he pushed her off the bridge and said, Die, heretic! You know, it's an over-dramatization, sometimes, of how people of God communicate with one another, but it's really a human condition that John Ortberg is addressing here, because we approach conversations with people with preconceived notions, right? We have preconceived notions about how the conversation should go. We have preconceived notions about what the other person should contribute to our relationship in order to make this thing healthy. It's a universal thing. It's our preconceived notions. And to be honest with you, we don't like it one bit when those preconceived notions get challenged, do we? Let me give you another example. We live in the South, and here in the South, every fall, we have a different religion that pops up. What do we call that? We call it football. No, you won't hear me say that, Larry Underwood. We call it football. We call it football. And every year, as summer begins to turn into fall, People gather in stadiums and around television sets, and they have the preconceived notion that this year just might be their team's year. Until week two or three of the season, and they realize that's not going to be their team's year. And all of a sudden, their cheering becomes jeering. They're not so excited about their team anymore, and then they just chalk it up, well, maybe next year. I mean, think about it. We, for our sports team, we cheer our players. We love our quarterbacks. Every person that roots for a team thinks they have the greatest quarterback. They should win the Heisman Trophy every year, and they should go number one in the NFL draft. Until, in the big game, our all-star quarterback throws the ball a couple of times to the wrong uniform. All of a sudden, they're no longer superstars. They're bums who no longer deserve the starting job, right? How quick are we to go from one extreme to to the other. Now, I get it, y'all. There are some people looking at me going, oh my gosh, I'm so tired of sports analogies in the sermon. Let me give you another one. I'll give you a different one. Before COVID, we would gather in movie theaters when 
movies we wanted to see would come out, we would get excited because of the storyline, because of the director, because of the cast of actors, and because of the, the, the roles that they were to play. And we would gather and we would get our big tubs of popcorn and we would sit there with anticipation waiting to be awed and we knew good and darn well how we wanted the end of that movie to turn out. And if it did not, woe be unto Hollywood. Our cheers quickly turned in to jeers. I'm here to tell you, if a movie doesn't have a happy ending and my wife watches it, you don't want to talk to her for the rest of the day. She's done for the rest of the day. She's down in the dump. I can't believe it. Can you believe what they did? From cheers to jeers. Let me give you one more example. Every few years, we stand in line and we cast our votes for people. People that we believe line up with what we think and our notions of what leaders should and should not do, and we cast our votes regardless of which side of the aisle you do that on. That's not the important part. The important part is we cast that vote, and we have a preconceived notion of what we expect these leaders to do, and the first time one of these leaders steps out of the box and votes in a way or acts in a way we do not approve of, no longer are they blessed leaders. They are cursed liars. Now, I give you those examples not to challenge your politics or, or your football team, because good Lord, this room's full of Alabama team, and most every year is your year. I give you those examples to let you know this is a human problem. This is a human thing. We have preconceived notions. You step into a church service having preconceived notions about how the music should sound, what the pastor should wear, and how short or long the sermon should be, and how well you should enjoy it, and how engaging the pastor should be while they're delivering the sermon. We have these preconceived notions just about everything that we do. So, in making that point, I offer this to you. It's a pretty obvious truth that challenging the preconceived notions of others can turn cheers into jeers and blessing into cursing. We do not like our preconceived notions challenged. Our text today is full of preconceived notions. And before I can properly tell you how Jesus really challenges these preconceived notions, before we can really stand in the dirt with the great crowd that waved their palm branches on that day and laid their clothes in the road, before we can really stand in the dirt with them... I need to take you back a little bit before this. I need to set the context. Because in, we, when we set the context, you then have a better understanding of the preconceived notions that Jesus was pushing back against as he rode into Jerusalem on that day. So we're going to go back to around 167 B.C., or for you scholars, B.C.E., which means before the Common Era, because you can't have a scholarly conversation without saying such things. So we're going to go back to 167 B.C. During this time, God's people, the Jewish people, were living under the reign of Greece, the Greeks. And in particular, where they lived, the part of the world they were in, they were under what was known as the Seleucid Empire. Now, the leader of the Seleucid Empire at this time is one we call Antiochus IV or Antiochus Epiphanes. When Antiochus Epiphanes rose to power... He took what was kind of a loose mandate where the, the, leader, the Greek leaders wanted uh, other uh, nations that were under their rule to kind of be Hellenized or made more Greek in culture and practice and religion and whatnot. But they left some people alone. The people in Judea, God's people, the Jews, were pretty much left alone to worship how they wanted to. When Antiochus Epiphanes rose to power, he said, No more. You will be like us or you will be no more. So in 167 B.C., he invaded Jerusalem and devastated the city and desecrated the temple. He sacrificed a pig on the altar of the temple. You don't get any more unclean than a pig in ancient Jewish tradition. He sacrificed it on the altar and then erected a statue of Zeus in the temple above the altar. He outlawed circumcision. He outlawed temple worship. And if he found copies of the Jewish law, he burned them. God's people were in dire straits. They had lost their land. It was now under the control of uh, foreign governments. They had now lost their temple. It had been devastated and desecrated. And their precious law, which set them apart as God's people, was now being burned wherever it was found. They had no king, no land, no law. Do you see how dire their situation is? 
out of this horrible situation arose a family. We call them the Maccabees. And the Maccabees led a revolt against Antiochus Epiphanes' army. And according to 1 Maccabees 15.51, now time out, 1 Maccabees is what we call an apocryphal book. It's not part of our 66 uh, canonical uh, uh, scripture uh, books. But in some other traditions, our Roman Catholic friends, Greek Orthodox, Coptics, Roman Orthodox, these apocryphal books are part of their scripture. They offer us history. They offer us insight. They're very valuable books. And so in 1 Maccabees 15.51, we hear and we see that Simon Maccabeus drove out the Seleucid soldiers who hailed from Syria. He took back control of Jerusalem and the temple. And the text goes on to say this. This is very important. On the 23rd day of the second month, Simon Maccabeus, along with his people, entered the city, Jerusalem, and the temple with shouts of praise, singing of hymns, and the waving of palm branches. Now do you see the context? Let's fast forward to Jesus entering into the city. God's people at the time of Jesus were living under the oppressive hand of Rome. They were looking for another Simon Maccabeus to drive out the oppressor and return them to their place of prominence. They wanted to be set apart from the other nations as they once were. And Jesus rides into town with other notions. Jesus has a different agenda. Jesus came into town not to separate the nations, but Jesus came so that he might draw all people. And all means all. Might draw all people unto him. In Mark's gospel, where we find our text, this is the first time Jesus has made his way into Jerusalem. Now the, other, the synoptics tell it a little bit different. Jesus has other trips to Jerusalem as they tell it. Mark waits until right at the end of Jesus' ministry to bring him into Jerusalem. And there's uh, good theology behind that. But that's just how Mark tells the story. So Jesus in Mark's gospel is entering Jerusalem for the first time. And man, does he make an entrance. It's during the festival of Passover. Now, think about this with me. You have pilgrims making the journey up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Historian Josephus even said that some three million pilgrims would make this journey. Can you imagine how swollen that city was? Can you imagine three million people descending upon Florence? The city was swollen. Can you imagine the crowd? Can you imagine the tension that was going on in the city? This is the scene in which Jesus decides to ride in to the city and go to the temple. It was a huge deal. Jesus is entering the city by way of the Mount of Olives. And as they begin to enter, Jesus stops the procession. He pulls aside two disciples and he says, Hey, you two. Right there, yeah, you two. I need you to go into the city and fetch me an unridden donkey's colt. Not even a full-grown donkey in Mark's gospel, but a donkey's colt, right? You'll, you'll find it. It's right by the gate, tied up. When you see it, untie it, bring it to me. If somebody says, hey, what's going on? Say, his master needs it. He'll bring it back right away, and they'll leave you alone. This plan was well devised, it was well preconceived, and it worked to perfection. The disciples do what they're told, they go find the donkey, they untie it, they answer the people's questions, the people are like, fine, take the donkey, and they take it back out to Jesus, they put their clothes on top of it, Jesus hops on the donkey, and begins riding into town. <clears throat> and as he's riding, he's riding too much fanfare. People clip branches as they walk in from the Mount of Olives from the fruit trees there. They begin waving them. Does this sound familiar? Think Maccabees. When Simon Maccabeus and his people walked into the city they had just freed from foreign oppression, they waved palm branches. The people sang and shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Does this sound familiar? Think Maccabees. The people sang hymns and shouted praise as they entered the city and went to the temple in order to cleanse it. The people said, blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Does this sound familiar? Think Maccabees, because it was Simon Maccabeus who drove out the Syrians and allowed the Jewish people to return to the worship of God in what? The temple, who was built by 
the line and ancestry of David. Do you see their preconceived notion as they wave their branches and lay their clothes down on the road? They think they have found their new Simon Maccabeus who is going to drive out the oppressor and raise them back to prominence. But Jesus had other intentions. Church, Jesus rode in not on a horse of war, not on a white or a black or an imposing stallion. Jesus rode into town on a donkey. And not even a full-grown donkey in Mark's gospel. It's a donkey's colt. As Jesus straddled this thing, his feet may very well have been dragging the ground. He was not sitting elevated high above everyone else as if he were looking down upon them. He was riding this service animal, a beast of burden, if you will, not a war horse. And he did so to make a point. Then after entering the city, Jesus went to the temple, looked around. He said, well, it's late. It's time for us to go go to bed. So he and the gang went back to Bethany. And the next day, they come back into Jerusalem, and they go into the temple. And notice this. I want you to understand, Jesus didn't come to town to declare war. He went to the temple the very next day. And he gets upset. He turns over the money changer's table, and he drives out the uh, those that are selling animals and such. But notice Did Jesus lift a sword to anybody? No. As a matter of fact, after he did this, he looks at those who he had just turned their tables over and he says, there's a better way. Have you not heard? My father's house is to be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. There is a better way. Instead of drawing his sword and declaring war, Jesus chose to teach and offer all who would hear and listen a better way. In fact, he spent the whole rest of that week prior to his arrest teaching. He taught his disciples. He would enter into verbal contests with the Pharisees and Sadducees, and he would best them in these verbal contests. He would witness a widow given her last bit of coinage in the temple, and he declared her gift was the most valuable of all because she gave out of what she had, not out of abundance. She gave with a heart full of grace and gratitude. The whole time Jesus is in Jerusalem, he's teaching the people, all who would listen, all who would see, all who would give him an audience, that there is a better way. And then as the week draws to a conclusion, Jesus takes his outer robe off, ties a towel around his waist, he washes the feet of his disciples, and he dries them with that towel. What an incredible act of humility. We're going to talk more about that on Thursday. But some scholars say that this manner of foot washing is reserved a duty reserved for the lowest slave. But other scholars say, no, that's not true at all, because in the resources that we have, the slave that was responsible for foot washing would simply bring a wash basin full of water and the individual would wash their own feet. Jesus didn't just bring the wash basin and have his disciples wash their own feet. He did it for them, taking the form lower than the lowest slave. And then he shared a meal with his friends and gave them a new covenant. This is how Jesus spent his last week. Now, I want you to get this. I want you to get the understanding. So I'm going to offer this next quote to you a couple of times. If you happen to be on social media and you want to post something from today's sermon, you want to get a couple of things stirred up, you want to have some conversations, I got something for you. Hear this quote through the lens of what I've just told you about Jesus challenging their preconceived notions and his manner of ministry. Jesus didn't come to declare war but to offset humanity's warring mindset with grace. As Jesus enters Jerusalem, He's making it clear by the way He enters, the animal He rides and the teaching that He offers, Jesus didn't come to declare war, but to offset humanity's warring mindset with grace. This mindset, this manner of doing ministry, flew in the face of every preconceived notion that existed within Jerusalem on that particular week because the people thought they had their new Simon Maccabeus. It flew in the face of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They thought they had 
the lockdown on what it meant to understand God and God's grace. But Jesus says there's a better way. And he challenged their preconceived notions. And challenging the preconceived notions of others turns cheers into jeers and blessing into curses. And that is exactly what happened, church. Jesus challenged the preconceived notions of those who wanted another Simon Maccabeus and what started out as a palm branch waving parade on Sunday turned into a day of cursing and crucifixion by Friday. My, my, my. How hearts were turned and how quickly they were turned as well. Challenging the preconceived notions of others can turn cheers into jeers and blessings into curses. And at this point in our worship service, I want to pivot. I want to turn. I want us to transition from the parade of palms to the passion and suffering of Jesus. If you will, I literally want us to turn from blessing to cursing. The parade of palms and the celebration has come to an end, and now we need to know how the rest of the story goes. And we need to see how it turned from celebration to crucifixion. To do that, I'm going to read to you from Mark chapter 15. Now, if you are like me, it was around 3 a.m. before I got to sleep last night because of the weather and such things, so I'm running on caffeine and adrenaline. So it might not be a good idea for me to close my eyes and listen to someone read to me. But if you're okay with closing your eyes to hear this story afresh and anew, I don't want it to just wash over you afresh and anew. I want it to arrest you. I want it to arrest your heart of how quick we turn from cheering to jeering and blessing to cursing. You can look at the image on the screen if you would rather and just get to a place where you can hear this and internalize it, digest it, and let it work on you. Hear these words. At daybreak, the chief priests with the elders, legal experts, and the whole Sanhedrin formed a plan. They bound Jesus, led him away, and turned him over to Pilate. Pilate questioned him. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, that's what you say. The chief priests were accusing him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Aren't you going to answer? What about all these accusations? But Jesus gave no more answers, so that Pilate marveled. During the festival, Pilate released one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. A man named Barabbas was locked up with the rebels who had committed murder during an uprising. The crowd pushed forward and asked Pilate to release someone, as he regularly did. Pilate answered them, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? He knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of jealousy, but the chief priests stirred up the crowd, the same crowd that a few days prior had celebrated Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. But the chief priests stirred up this very crowd to have him release Barabbas to them instead. Pilate replied, Then what do you want me to do with the one you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back. They did not shout back Hosanna. They did not shout back, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They did not shout back, Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. They shouted back, Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Why? What wrong has he done? They shouted even louder, Crucify him. Pilate wanted to satisfy the crowd, so he released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus whipped then handed Jesus over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the courtyard of the palace known as the governor's headquarters. They called together the whole company of soldiers. They dressed him up in a purple robe and twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on him. They saluted him. Hey, king of the Jews. Again and again, they struck his head with a stick. They spit on Jesus and knelt before him to honor him. When they finished mocking him, they stripped him of the purple robe and put his own clothes back on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Simon, a man from Cyrene, Alexander and Rufus' father, was coming in from the countryside. They forced Simon to carry Jesus' cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means skull place. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. They crucified Jesus. 
They divided up his clothes, drawing lots for them to determine who would take what. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The notice of the formal charge against him was written, the king of the Jews. They crucified two outlaws with him, one on his right and one on his left. People walking by insulted him, shaking their heads and saying, Ha! So you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days where you save yourself and come down from that cross. In the same way, the chief priests were making fun of him among themselves together with the legal experts. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross. Then we'll see and believe. Even those who had been crucified with Jesus insulted him. There's no repentant thief in Mark's telling. From noon until three in the afternoon, the whole earth was dark. At three, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you left me? After hearing him, some standing there said, look, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a pole. He offered it to Jesus to drink, saying, let's see if Elijah will come take him down. But Jesus let out a loud cry, and Jesus died. Challenging the preconceived notions of others can turn cheers into jeers and blessings into curses, celebration into crucifixion. May we sit in the uncomfortableness of the image that's before you. May we sit in the uncomfortableness of jeering and cursing and crosses over the next week. May we realize more fully all that Jesus did for us. When you look into a mirror, you see the face of one whom Jesus loves, whom he loves enough to endure this very image for. Let us sit with that this week. Let us celebrate on Thursday and on Friday, prepare ourselves for a little bit of silence on Saturday because next Sunday, Jesus will not be on the cross. Jesus will not be in the tomb. And our curses in the midst of His marvelous grace can turn into cheers of victory and resurrection. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All who are able, please stand and join me in the Apostles' Creed, our affirmation of faith. And while we say these historic words affirming our faith, if our instrumentalists and vocalists would come forward for our closing hymn. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All who are able, please remain standing for our closing hymn. And as we sing our closing hymn, the altar is open for you if you need to come and pray and offer a fresh blessing or maybe um, ask Jesus for a moment of forgiveness because your cheering for His grace has turned into jeering of some kind. As we sing, the altar is open for you.
before receiving the benediction, be reminded we got a lot of stuff going on this week. No youth and children activities on Wednesday, but on Thursday at 6 o'clock here, uh, Monday, Thursday service. Friday at 6 o'clock in the Family Life Center, we will have a tenebrae service of shadows. Saturday at 1 o'clock for 6th grade and under, we have an Easter egg hunt. I mean, what could be better than collecting candy and eating hot dogs? I think that sounds like a good time. Come and be a part of that. The next Sunday morning at our normal worship times, we will gather and we will celebrate once again the resurrection of Jesus. Every Sunday for us is a little Easter, but next Sunday is special. Next Sunday is the one where we declare unashamedly that He is not here. That He's risen. Hallelujah. Before... um, Once again, receiving the benediction, be reminded that there are offering plates on the prayer rail and before you leave the sanctuary. If you would like to give to the mission and ministry of Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church, your financial giving will be appreciated. You are a giving and loving church, and for that we say thank you. Thank you for your faithful and generous giving. Now receive the benediction, church. Challenging the preconceived notions of others can turn cheers into jeers and blessing into cursing. This week, ask Jesus to challenge one of your deeply held preconceived notions so that you might become more like Jesus. Also, invite someone to attend worship with you next week. It's Easter, after all. May our services, those online and in person, burst at the seams, just like Jerusalem did when Jesus rode into town in the midst of as many as three million pilgrims who had come to observe the Passover. As you go into the world to love and serve God, go knowing that the love of God, the grace of Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with each and every one of us. That's good news, church. We're not going it alone. As John Wesley said, best of all, God is with us. And together, the church said, Amen.